Thank you. Yeah. Talking about death, how it happens, and how to help other people die, including our pussycats and the bobcat, if we could have. And of course, be ready for our own death. That's the idea, you know. And uh, it's using Lama's of Rimshay's book, teachings cobbled together from his various teachings, particularly a teaching in France in 2000 something or other, but then other teachings as well. But as I mentioned before, it's like it's a handbook, basically, two thirds of it, easy two thirds of it, it's about 400 pages. Easy two thirds of it is all the practices that Rimshay mentions at different stages, all numbered from one to 87, sutras and all kinds of names of Buddhas, practices, meditations, you know, mantras, they're all there in the back. So it's an extremely helpful handbook. And it's also, it's all been presented in chronological order from the point of view of the person who's dying. You know, these background parts that we're looking at now and then, you know, what to do at the time, you know, there's weeks and months before. And the assumption here, of course, is a person who's dying slowly, you know the days before, the hours before, the, at the time the breath stops, and then the time when the mind leaves the body, and then the days after. So it's a chronological order, the best things to do at each stage. So it's extremely practical. So, of course, it's all taken from Lama Zobrimshay's point of view of the Tibetan Buddhist approach, which is coming from the, much of it coming from the Vajrayana understanding of things. So it might not be the same as you'd learn in a Zen center or a Thai Buddhist center because of the Vajrayana component. So are we going to be here together for a few hours or whatever? May these may maybe listen, think about it, contemplate the meaning, take some advice from it if it's useful. So we can in the long term continue to develop our marvelous potential if we Buddha, but the short term achieve this understanding of death and the process so we can help others and for sure help ourselves. And we can do the refuge prayer if you like. Okay. Right, so the first two lines expressing our reliance on the Buddha and his teachings, and the second two lines expressing this, you know, altruistic motivation, as the Lamas would say. We might say reason or purpose of being here together to listen to these teachings. Sange tarang soke tognam la, jang cho badu dagni kyabsu chi, dagi chon yen gi pesonam ki, drola penchir sange drupa shog, sange tarang soke tognam la, jang cho badu dagni kyabsu chi, dagi chon yen gi pesonam ki, drola penchir sange drupa shog, sange tarang soke tognam la, jang cho badu dagni kyabsu chi, dagi chon yen gi pesonam ki, Let's summarize what we talked about last night. This is from the point of view of Buddha's teachings within the Vajrayana, including, of course, therefore the Sutra teachings of the Mahayana, and therefore, of course, including the Sutra teachings of the Hinayana, the teachings we share with that part of the path. So it's all based on the understanding of the mind being not physical, the mind being a continuity of mental moments that comes from past lives and goes to future lives, and based on this natural law of the karma of cause and effect that whatever any mind does and thinks and says leaves seeds in the mind that produces a future person. So all of this is the background to um, Rinpoche's advice about how to prepare for death. So last time, as I said, you know, there's one the practical way to apply the teachings about death is to live your life in the context of the fact, those facts and the fact that um, we don't know when death will come. The you know, Buddha teaches extensively on impermanence. There's all these extensive teachings on subtle impermanence, which, which can't be realized with a grosser level of mind, it needs to be realized in meditation. But he just, he, Atisha and then Tsongkhapa in the Lam Rim emphasized the gross impermanence, not just the impermanence of, you know, tables and toilets and moons, but of oneself, which of course is, is, implies his agenda. It's a teaching about impermanence, but his, his agenda is to give us a wake-up call, not to waste this precious life, to alert us, to energize us, to want to wake up and use this life, not waste this life, which then gets us to karma, which is how we apply that. So not wasting this life, this is, this is a crucial point, you know. It's very precise for the Buddha. 
not wasting this life, means doing anything less. Well, it means, you know, at least not doing actions with our body and speech that harm others and learning to attempt to not follow the neuroses, follow the delusions, follow the afflictions. So in other words, the first stages of practice, control the body, speech, and mind. Ideally live in vows of ethics, good ethics, morality, no harming others. And then on the basis of that, understanding our mind, as Lama Yeshi says, becoming our own therapist, identifying attachment, distinguishing it from the virtues, giving up anger and all the other neuroses. That's the minimum approach. This is the minimum approach. Forget compassion, forget the body type of a path, forget emptiness, forget the six perfections, but that's the first level of practice. And at the very least, when you die, you'll get a really good future life, a really nice human body, and good conditions, good tendencies, good experiences, and a good environment, which is surely what we want. The bare minimum is what we want. Forget nirvana, forget enlightenment, you know. The very least we want, the very least we want is another decent human rebirth in a good in good conditions. So the core, therefore we have to know the causes. Pretty obvious. If you want something, I want an ice cream, then our next step is what how do I get it? What are the causes? It's obvious, logical. And we're very good at this. We always know exactly to get what we want. We know how to do it. We know how to create the causes, as they say. So here, that means we have to understand karma. It's completely obvious for ourselves. You can't help the mouse. You know, you can't give teachings to the mouse about negative karma, positive karma, but you can help protect it at least from creating negative karma. And then, and that's why, that's why, from the point of view of helping others, humans have some ability to take some advice and listen and do the job themselves in their mind. But animals have no chance at all. So this is why <clears throat> helping animals is a very specific thing. You know? And the main way to help from the mum and lover's perspective is to bless their mind by hearing mantras and, and the Dharma because of the power of the object. This is a crucial point to understand that gives, gives logic to why imitates most of these practices are listening to sutras and listening to the names of the Buddha and listening to that one, doing that practice. Why are these beneficial? How are they beneficial? Because, I mean, if you're a materialist, they just sound like a load of rubbish, you know, just religion, wasting time. So it's important to understand. Let's spell it out from the, from the, teachings, on the, from the teachings, you know, give reason, logic for it. Of course, don't just believe it, but to look into this. In general, in general, everything we think and do and say sow seeds in the mind. Best way to say it. This is Buddha's analogy: seeds and fruits. You know, everything we think and do and say programs our mind. Everything the mouse thinks and does and says, oh, whatever, makes sow seeds in its mind. You know. Will, ring, will ripen his um, experiences. So the bobcat, you know, assuming it's true, got eaten alive due to past killing. And those coyotes just created the cause to have a more lower realm suffering and to get killed again, as well as to continue to kill. So um, If the way to get out of, if, if the way, if the, if the thing is to try and practice and at least not do negative things with body, speech, and mind, it's only really us humans can do that consciously because we've got enough, we have, fortunately, we have enough access to some virtue. I mean, not most humans, we can see. I wonder, I'm not, not being rude about anybody, but how many humans really look into their minds? How many humans really know that whatever goes on in their mind plays a role in their life? What, what humans really are trying to be better human beings and stop lying and killing and stealing? That's a very reasonable question. Not many, probably. Many are experiencing the fruits of past virtue, having beautiful conditions, healthy bodies, people liking them. That's just using up past karma, whether we're really creating more need to look, not being judgmental. But humans have the possibility, but I wonder how many use it, but animals don't have the possibility. And then forget, forget the other realms of existence that Buddha would assert as existing, where the vast majority of all sentient beings 
abide in intense suffering, these realms of existence, all the fruit of non-virtue, all the fruit of their own actions, you know. So for the animals, the ones we can see, how do we help them if they if we can't give them advice? We can so first one is we can protect them from harm. You know? You have a cat, try and protect it from killing the mice. Protect them from harming. You can't tell them to do it. The imprint is too strong. That's one way. That's good enough. That's pretty good. At least they don't create more negative karma. But how to really help and this is this is the, the majority of the advice in the book. So it is important to understand why. Why is it helpful for a, a dog to hear a mantra? How does it help a dog? Or for that matter, a human? Both of us. Why? How? This is because most of this is Rimache's advice. So this is this is based on the on the on the um, so in general we create karma. But it, the mind needs to be involved in it. Okay, this is the essential point. Even if you kill a mouse with that with no thought, they say there's some karmic imprint there. I don't quite know how. If the mind is not involved, like the mouse could be there. You could stand on it. It could die, but you didn't see it or you didn't intend to kill it. That's very common. We're killing all the time. Just by existing, we're killing other beings. Harming other beings. But if the mind's not involved, you can say there's pretty much not, not much. Well, they do say somehow in the Lamarine there's some kind of something, residual result. I don't quite understand why. If the mind isn't involved. Because karmic imprints are imprinted in the mind. And that's intent. The first one's the intention. I will. Then the motivation that, that, that underpins that intention. They're the central players that create karma. So, for example, and this is a crucial point for us to be, to be ready for death. At the time of death, we discussed the process today. As I mentioned in the book, there are two... Um, the two teachings. One is on what occurs in terms of the 12 links at the time of death. They play out every second of our life. But at the time of death, they play a particular role. Some of them play a particular role, which he talks about it. So at the time of death, before the before about the time the person starts the death process, and that death process we're referring to is from the Vajrayana one, those eight stages of deconstruction of the various components. So the, the, the twelve links components kick in around then. So the the the, the one that so the one the the uh, the condition that causes the karmic seed that'll determine your next life to be triggered at that time is the eighth, the uh, seventh and eighth, the eighth and ninth links craving and grasping. So they play out every second of the day, and they're just levels of attachment. But at the time of death, they play a very particular role. So, um, by the time you stop, as you start to, as you start to, you know, the, the earth element gets a bit heavy, your eyes start to go, your ears start to go, and then by about the second, that's the second, and by the third, second and third stage is when your senses are ceasing, this intense gra craving kicks in. Well, Lama talks, maybe she talks about it. The craving kicks in, and this is attachment. And so attachment, as we know from teachings, is multifaceted. And it manifests here as because one of the functions of attachment is to hold on to something, fear of letting go of something that we know. That's why we cling to things so intensely, hugely. And that at death is clinging mightily to this. This is the main source of suffering of fear at death, remember Jay says. This is stupendously powerful. Even if you're a really good practitioner, this is so instinctive, it's still there. That's why you need a person next to you who's loving you and being kind to you and helping you through the process, you know, holding your hand, basically. So the intense grasping kicks in to hold on to this. Now, the way Rimache talks about it, and frankly, I find it a bit hard to understand, is, I'll just say briefly here, then grasping kicks in, this intense level of attachment, even more strong than craving. So that grasping, uh, which is, um, Rimache says, it's, 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 uh, for us humans, at the time of our past death, he said it could have been many lives ago, we could have been a kangaroo or a bug, you know. This occurs. The craving kicked in, holding on, fear, then grasping kicked in. And he said it would have been grasping 
to a human life. So I don't quite know how that fact works out, you know. To say it's a dog. Maybe you might have been a dog in the past life. How we grasp at a human life, I don't honestly understand that if you're a dog. Maybe maybe your dog now, it's possible to me, it seems possible, if you're helping your little doggy and your doggy's really attached to you, then it will make sense that they're grasping at that humanity. That could be the, then that becomes the trigger for the second of the 12 links, which is the karmic seed in their bank vault. I like to call that analogy. To be, to be, to be man, sort of to be awakened. So the fact is, and what I'm getting at here is, in order to get another human body, that needs to be a really good, delicious, rich, intentional, non-killing karmic seed. In other words, we need bucket loads of really strong, delicious, non-killing karmic seeds in our bank vault just to get another decent human life next life. It needs to be available to us at that time, at the time of death. Now, this is the point now. For us humans, we've got some intelligence and you know some ability to access our virtues. The only time you create the karma of non-killing is when your mind's involved in it. There has to be the thought, I must not kill. And then that has to be driven by um, pure motivation, like compassion. And of course, you're only going to have that thought when you meet a sentient being, like the mouse or the ant. You don't just walk around the life saying, oh, I mustn't kill, I mustn't kill, I mustn't kill. In order for the karma of non-killing to occur, there's got to be a living being in front of you. Right there, there, in front of you. Not just abstract. And then the attention arises, I must not kill. Then the motivation is, hey, compassion. And then you, not, then, you, then you save the mouse and then the ha happy mouse. That's roughly speaking. Then you pop a really delicious non-killing non, non karmic seed into your bank vault. But how often in a day does that occur? Not often. You see my point? We don't meet sentient beings every second. If you're living in the, in the rainy season in India, it's like Jurassic Park, then you'd have it every second. You're avoiding the mosquitoes and the big creatures. I mean, in Bodh Gaya, in the rainy season, at the, the stupa there, I remember, when the, when the dusk comes, the, 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 the ground is a carpet of living beings, all flapping their little wings, you know. I mean, then you really got to be paying attention, really intending not to kill. Then you, you're putting a few deep and karmic seeds into your bank vault. But you know, when here, I mean, on my new place in New York City, I don't meet a little creature. Very rarely. So we're not creating any kind of non killing. But just, you see, that's the thing. We, we think, well, well, I'm a nice person. I don't kill. But that's too abstract. There's no mind that's thinking, I won't kill. It's only then. And it's obvious if your mind doesn't think it, how can there be an imprint in your mind? If the mind doesn't think something, how can they be imprint in your mind? It's logical. So the mind has to be involved in order to, quote, unquote, create karma. So how do you go about that? Well, this is the point now. There are two main powerful ways of creating, of making our actions powerful. One is, and that's for us humans, is living in vows. A vow is a strong intention, a strong decision to refrain from certain actions of behavior, specifically that especially harming others. So if you live in a vow, they say in the teachings, they're like this subtle physical energy that's visible to clairvoyance. It's psychologically powerful. You know yourself, when you make a vow, I will not eat more than this much food every day, or any vow. You know, any decision, I'm going to kill every ant I see. That's more powerful than just occasionally killing an ant, isn't it? It's in your mind driving you to kill every ant you see. Or if you're not eating too much food, it's driving you. It's there on your shoulder guiding you. Every time you see the cake, you say, remember, Rabin, you decided not to kill, not to eat. That's a vow. A vow is a decision to refrain from something. A commitment is a decision to do something. So it's logical, they're powerful. It's more powerful psychologically. We're taking, we're doing vows all the time. I use this simple example. When you learn to drive a car, you vow to not do hundreds of things and you learn them. You don't have your guidebook on your knee. When, what's the next step? Second gear? You'll be dead in a second. You've got to remember, you internalize, I must not put the foot on the brake at the same time as the accelerator. I must not turn the wheel left if I'm going to go right. You program your mind with these decisions. That's obviously strong mentally. Psychologically, that's how you learn things. And why do you do that in relation to cars? To become a good car driver. Why do you do this in relation to not killing, not stealing, not lying? In order to become a better, nice, good human being. 
It's logical. The vows are stupendous. So, you know, as I said, and as Thomas Dober says, and this is the point, when you have a vow not to kill, for example, this one, not to kill, and the others, whatever, every second it's in your mind, it's, it's, um, it's so powerful that just the power of that vow in causes you to be ticking over and dropping into your bank vault 24 hours a day, non-killing karmic seeds. And because the vows prevent you from doing it, and they also function as an atomic bomb under the habits of past killing, it's the most radical way to purify your mind, just by living in vows. Just by living in vows. It was 24 hours a day, even when you're not thinking about it, even when there's no motivation there. Powers, uh, vows are so powerful, they're more strong than that. So that's a no-brainer for us humans. Now, animals can't do that. So the other way to make our actions powerful, and this is what's behind all of Ramachay's teachings, especially helping other people, we talk about the power of the object. Object, in this sense, always used in Buddhist terms in terms of the, the person or the, the person um, you're relating to in the action. So the power of the object would be just by hearing mantras, by hearing the sound related to certain Buddhas, by seeing a Buddha's image, by even brass reciting. The power of the enlightened beings is so strong that that enables the action we do to have more power, have more power. That has to be thought about. And this is the basis of most of the pieces of advice Ramesha gives in this book. Why to play mantras to animals. I mean, the story I gave, two, two, two examples I gave yesterday. You know, my friend Judy, the only thing she can remember from being weeks in a, in a, in a, in a coma is these the words I said to her in relation to her teachers, you know. The only thing Jeffrey Hopkins can find in his mind in those weeks of being in a total, total deep coma because of, uh, you know, what it was called, that disease, what was it? Lyme's disease was his mantra. Just, so we need to think about that. Well, for example, you know, even um, the power of mantra is said to be huge, sound is, mantra, in the way the Vajrayana describes, we've got, remember we've got, and we're going to do this more detail again this morning, the components of a person. I had it open there, now it's gone. The components of a person, you know, the different things that make us up the five aggregates, and then, you know, very subtle consciousness, gross consciousness, and uh, subtle consciousness, and then these physical components of this subtle body. So the gross body is this body, the bag of bones that's connected to the gross level of consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness. Not the eyeball, ear, ball, ear, ear no, the physical is connected to the consciousness, mind. Then you've got subtle consciousness, which is our mental states. Thoughts and feelings and emotions. They're much more subtle. And they've got, they're too connected to a physical energy, but a subtle physical energy, like I said yesterday, there's 72,000 subtle channels throughout our entire body. And then within those channels, the subtle nervous system causing this subtle wind energy or prana. The Vajrayana says that, the, I mean, the, the Buddha's view is that the world consists of matter and minds. That's it. Matter and minds. Matter is the four elements. Clearly, in science, we don't talk like that now. Matter and minds, and the matter is the four elements. So the internal, external, the entire external world is the four elements. This body is the four elements. This is exactly the same as the computer and the carpet. A, you know, a, a mixture of the four elements. The difference with this one is it's con this this set of four elements is conjoined with a consciousness. That's a sentient being, you know, a mind possessor. So the subtle physical energy is this subtle channel, subtle channels, these subtle winds. And then there's also the extra piece I didn't discuss. I don't want to talk about the winds. I'll go back to that. Uh, the, the subtle is this uh, what they call red and white kundalini, red and white drop that comes from the mummy and daddy. So when you're, we'll talk about this, when you go from the intermediate state, when your mother and father hop into bed, your mind runs like a magnet, your very subtle consciousness runs like a magnet and joins this subtle red and white drops, they call them, which is the subtle level of the egg and the sperm of the mother and father. And this subtle red and white drop, that's the beginning. Your mind conjoins that subtle red and white drops. 
and that's the beginning of you. You start at your heart chakra, and then through the time in the womb, you then grow, grow up, and all the pieces come together, and you develop into the fetus. And then at the time of death, that red and white drop at the a heart chakra, like a tiny bean, opens up, and your clear light consciousness then leaves. That's when death occurs. We'll go through that. But meanwhile, that's the subtle body, this, the channels, the wind energies, and these drops we talk about. And then within all, and all these channels, there's millions of them all over the body, or well, not millions, but thousands. But there's all kind of, they're all jumbled and locked. So there's a central channel. Look, we'll discuss it more in detail. I want to just make the point here of how sound, mantra is so powerful. Sound is wind. The wind is sound. And the purest sounds, all the, they all say this, are the Sanskrit sounds. The sounds of Sanskrit. Said to be so pure, so blessed. Don't just believe me. I'm telling you. I don't, you know, I haven't studied it all. I'm just passing on other surface information. So the mind is always conjoined with its own wind energies. The mind and winds are inextricably linked to whatever the mind does. First impacts upon the mind itself, like I said yesterday. If you're gonna, you know, be kind, kindness, then you develop the, the habit of kindness in your mind, and that kind mind immediately purifies the winds connected to that mind. That state of mind is how you purify your body and your mind. And that eventually, in turn, manifests as good health. And in turn, many lifetimes later, manifests as beautiful environment where everything's peaceful and harmonious and pure. We create the universe. So the thing about the sound is mantra is said to be the Sanskrit sounds. The Tibetans don't translate the mantras. Mantras, they, re they kept them in Sanskrit. And so this is what they say. So hearing, just hearing that animal, that little bug, hearing somehow, whatever, or even impressing on them that, that the imprint of that sound is, can connect them with the Buddhas. You know? And then it brings the energy of the Buddhas there. That's how they say. So that's how you benefit animals. So Rimeshe says, even a bone that's a thousand years old, the consciousness that used to be that whose body that was once, wherever that consciousness now might be, just by you saying mantra, you purify your breath, you bless your breath, then you blow on that bone. The consciousness that did live there once will get the benefit. So this is a way to redeem your action of eating meat, for example. You see the meat in the market, you do that, you blow on it. Or an animal that's alive, a little animal, just blow it. Or a dead animal, even, the side of the road, you blow mantra on it. Or you say mantra in the ears of the dying creature. And your, and your grandma. So this is why most of the practices which they talked about are these so-called religious ones, you know, which would be meaningless if we didn't have any understanding of how all this works. And of course, we have to think about it. Are we communicating? So this is how you benefit your animals. One of Rubishay's many, many, many projects is animal where he saves animals, you know, spends his life blessing them. I mean, spends his life stopping, stopping off and he, he has blessed he talks about this in one of the practices, blesses. So when he has his mantras, he says mantras all day, and then he blesses like um, seeds or like, yeah, and it keeps it. And then when he stops, if it goes by, drives by the road, there's a dead animal, he'll get out and he'll sprinkle it with his blessed seeds and say mantras for the animal. I remember one time in Kathmandu, we're driving on the ring road, they call it, uh, from where Wimshay was staying, the center there, to uh, Swayambu Stupa. And the ring road's kind of chaotic, you know, sort of vaguely lanes of traffic. You couldn't count, you couldn't know where they all go. They all go back to front. There's bulls on it and Lord knows what. Anyway, the driver, she hit a little family of ducks, in my accident, of course. So we stopped. And Rimeshay is in the middle of the ring road in Kathmandu for like 30 minutes, in the middle of the ring road, on the road. All the little ducks got away and mummy duck, but little baby duck didn't. So this little baby duck was lying there dying. His little heart, you can see his little heart exposed and it's still beating, you know. And Rimeshay is doing all these prayers and doing poa on the little baby duck, and saying many, many prayers for the duck, you know, and then tapping its consciousness to help it. We'll discuss this later. So I thought, what a lucky duck, what a good way to die, you know. Little baby duck. I mean, a good half an hour in the middle of the road saying prayers for the duck. Otherwise, what, you know, unless you're a doctor, what can you do? Nothing from the, from the materialist point of view. Saying a silly sound into somebody's ear is a stupid idea isn't it, from that perspective? So you have to understand this, you know. doesn't mean you have to believe it or like it. I'm just telling you. 
like an observer of nature, that's how he benefits, never stopping, never stopping, never stopping. Anybody, anywhere, any animals, any creatures, flies, dogs, anything, bulls, you know. In Kathmandu, he's got a place where he has liberated animals, you know. As soon as he's walking down, driving down the road and he sees all the animals ready to get killed, he's out there and he buys the goats and they've got to go off to a piece of land. He has a land there, you know. Constantly thinking about them, how to benefit them, how to stop, them, how to save their lives and how to bless them, how to bless their mind. This is a huge comp component of every all the bit of all the advice in this book. So this is the background to it. So the animal, the power of the object, the power of the sound of the mantra, and the power of the Buddhas overrides every, or overrides their ignorance. There's no, there's no need to be intentional. There'll be benefit. That's why you know when your person's dying, when you're saying quietly singing mantras, they don't have to even know what it means. The power of mantra is such. That it can, and even uh, that, that can benefit them. But it seems to me, even in one level, mantras are beneficial because they're very sweet sound. That can really calm the person's mind down and focus their mind you know, instead of being frantic. Okay, I want to just say that. So, therefore, if you live in vows, every second, every 24 hours a day, you're keeping them, you're, ticking, you're dropping karmic seeds into your bank vault. And when, of course, you do it with motivation as well, even more powerful. And they purify the habit. So this is what is so stupendous. And as Rambo says, just being good, being a nice person is not enough. The reason we even have a good life now, the reason we have conditions is because we practice in the past. The reason we have money in the bank is because we practice generosity. So in general, Rambo says, if you get a good human birth, you have to have masses of, of, of virtuous, of um, morality karma, meaning non-harming. And then you have to have masses of generosity karma to, give, to be born into a situation where you have conditions that then enable you to have the space and time and the miracle of space and time to want to practice a path. But the main, the huge benefit you can see of living in vows, when you understand that there are four ways that karma ripens, and the first one is the type of rebirth. And that's from non-killing. So we can see 7 million humans, 8 billion, whatever it is, I don't know. They've got a human body. But have a look at most humans when it comes to the other three, or if you like, the residual results of the karma. They, they continue to kill. They've got a human body, which is a result of non-killing. But most humans have a tendency to kill from past karma. Why? Because they haven't lived in vows to purify. The person, the only per the person that you meet in this life, a person who has no thought to kill from the time they're born and never arises in their mind to kill, that person has lived in vows in the past because that not only that not only helps you get a human body, the main result, it also purifies your tendency to kill, and that's the miracle. But most humans kill. Look at the number of humans that get killed. Babies die. You know, healthy people die. Happy people die. So the first in this life, the first result of non of killing is the, the within this life of the three results in this life, the tendency to kill is the result of non kill of killing. The experience of being killed or dying young is the result of the experience similar to the cause of past killing. The environmental result is you have unhealthy body or sickness or it's polluted and whatever, whatever. Look at the human world. Look at the human world. You know, the vast majority, so much sickness, so much dreadful environmental karma. So the, the condition, the main cause of environment being the way it is, is past killing. Not just uh, putting plastic in the wrong places and too much this and that. They're just the external conditions. So when you live in vows, you purify all four. So you wake up next life with a human body, no tendency to kill, won't get killed or die young, and you'll be very fit and healthy and the environment will be very harmonious for you. And surely the bare minimum is we need that. We want that. Like I said, bare minimum. And that's the first level of practice. First scope of practice in the lamb room. Okay. So let's go back to the bit we were talking yesterday. There's a bit more about the components. Yeah. components of a human body and of some animals, which he says.
Okay. So the components, as Ramesh says in chapter seven, what happens at death? So it says death. Remember, we said death is when the mind leaves the body. Not, and this is what worried Jennifer yesterday, you know, she's not here today. I can't see Jennifer. Um, was the thought, the fact that the mind is still there once you've stopped breathing, because the grosser level has ceased. And then the subtle mind, which is our mental state, so they're still there, you know, up for, up for three days. And so then you've got the five aggregates, this is the way the Buddha described the components of a person, which, of course, unless we begin to study it, is a bit sort of abstract, you know, why these five, you know. Then the four elements, earth, air, fire, water. That really is, as I said, that's especially the Vajrayana model. The universe is made of matter and minds, and that's it. And matter is the four elements. That's where you've got these realms of existence. And we even begin to understand that. And understand how, this is an incidental point, how karma is created, how minds program, how we create, our, how we program our own mind with our tendencies. And that impacts upon our wind, wind energies, which then gradually produces our future mind and our future bodies. So it's fairly evident, would you not think, that a person who spends their time lying or stealing or killing, not even necessarily being a, a really a monster, just not being conscious, following the habit of attachment, following the habit of anger and jealousy in the mind, maybe not even much on actions, you know. You're polluting your mind like crazy. You're programming your mind with delusions. And then when you do actions to harm others, or even just matters of attachment, you pollute your wind energies, and eventually that manifests that your mind conjoins with the predominance of air energy, all elements have all the four elements within them, but each one predominates. So air energy has earth and water and fire as well, but it's a predominant one. So a spirit, a being who's born as a hungry ghost or a spirit, is a person who's, especially their mind, incredibly intense attachment. So this, they end up being born, their mind is conjoined with the air element, and they fit from pillar to post. I mean, all, the, all the world we know of ghosts, that's exactly what they, they are, they're spirits. Due to intense attachment. I remember uh, the Geshe Lama Kontrog was an amazing yogi who lived at Kopan for years, very close to Lama Yeshe. And I wrote his biography for a while. It's not finished yet, but Tenzin, Geshe Tenzin Sopa, who's been here, hasn't he? It's, he's the attendant. For some reason, he hasn't let us publish it yet, but it's, he's a very amazing yogi, his main Lama. So I know what, he lived up in the mountains uh, in Nepal, way up in the mountains, up by the sort of. His, Nepal's kind of this crooked piece, and way up the top part near Tibet. And, um, and, uh, what's the story? That's right. So there's, he was helping the monk when he came, he was in a cave for years and years, naked, no food, no sleep, in total isolation. Lama Zopa said he lived in Badri Yogini's pure land. You know, this grumpy old grandfather looking, but he's actually Badri Yogini's naked, divine red lady, you know, the manifestation of purified attachment. That was his main practice. Anyway, um, there's this uh, these nunnery, and he helped the nuns. And one time he's in another cave miles away, and these nuns traipse up the cave for 12 hours. They clearly don't have cell phones. And they're crying, Annie Tenzin's gone crazy. Annie Tenzin's gone crazy. So one of their nuns, right? So he says, you stay here. I'll go down. So first of all, he whizzes down there really quickly because he's so ben he's so advanced as a tantric yogi. He can walk on the air, walk on the air. You know, he can run on the air. They can do that. So cause they've, they've completely controlled the four elements internal and external. So he gets down to this nunnery and he walks in the door and one of the nuns is in the bed and she's got this very deep voice, you know, and she's saying, Genla, go away, go away. She doesn't want to see Genla, Genla's teacher. And, she, and that the spirit, we're, we're assuming that's the truth, is a spirit of a, be, a person who had been a human in her. He'd been born as this spirit. So what, what it was was this. Genla went straight up to her the nun and could see what's going on. No, and the, because, see, a spirit has got intense, unbelievable. Spirit here is not the same as we use like the soul, completely different. It's a type of very, very suffering being, ghost, a disembodied being. This mind is conjoined with air energy and born like that as a rebirth as a result of an intense attachment. So this one, this spirit, he, she, again, I says to him, what do you want? Because he knows spirits go to where they want what they they go to their possessions. They're very if they're possessing, if they're very possessed, if they're very 
uh, attached to their possessions or to places. So a ghost that lives in a house, and you see this 17th century lady, for example, that's the, you know, the vision of the person who lived there once who's now born as a spirit in that place because of intense attachment to that place. That's how that happens. So this particular spirit in this nun, um, again, I said to him, what do you want? Why are you here? What do you want? And this deep voice, this male voice, I want my pink thermos with the white flowers. I want my pink thermos with the white flowers. And sure enough, there it was. And they remembered this villager who died recently had given that nun a thermos of tea. And they're a bit poor up there, right? So it was a precious object. And he's, he's annoyed and upset and attached to his thermos. And then he dies. And as a result of attachment to his thermos, people, he's born as a spirit, searching for his thermos. Um, excuse me, be careful with attachment. I mean, they're so poor up there, they don't even have shoes or money or anything. Look at our houses, you know. I remember a friend of mine who was in Kathmandu who married a Nepali, and the mother from the village came down to visit them in the house, and she had a very humble, she was Dutch, had a very humble little house with a humble little kitchen, and people who've been to Kathmandu know what I mean, might I mean, and she had a few little jars of rice and lentils, and the mother said, oh, you have a shop here, do you? Do you understand? They're so poor, right? So she's... um. So there's this poor little villager who's got his one precious thermos given to this nun and the nun forgets to give it back. And he's attached to his thermos and he dies with that attachment. He's born as a spirit searching for his thermos. So be careful with attachment, please. Another story in Kopan, also Geshe Lama Kama Poncho, this lady, a common thing that happens is when a spirit gets in you because they want something that you've got, that's a common thing. That's why people get possessed, you know. I come on this one woman, she kind of went crazy. They behave weirdly, you know. And so they asked Islam a contract, and he said, and he didn't know this woman. This, this spirit was the villager, so recognized Genla, you know. And again, I could see who he was in the nun. So this other woman had come to one of the courses, and again, I said, Oh, you'll find Islam a contract said, You'll find something in her, her luggage that is that. that that is connected to the spirit. So the girl said she was Jewish and she, we, they found this Jewish thing, object, in her bag. And so clearly this guy, this spirit, had been a, that was his possession. That her father had bought it in a second-hand shop, that's right. And, and he was attached to that and he wanted his thing back. Well, I have second thoughts about buying things in antique stores now, I promise you, because you get the spirit who owned it along with it. I mean, I know this is hilarious stories, but it's kind of powerful. It's just attachment to a thermos, not attachment to anything more. Attachment to a thermos, you know, or attachment to a little object. So, this attachment. Where was I? So, the wind energy in the body connected to the mind, and whatever the mind does, second by second, programs the mind and pollutes or purifies the winds connected to it, which eventually manifests as physical sickness or health, and then in turn, impacts upon the external elements and creates the cause for you to have a beautiful environment or a disgusting. We are the creators of the universe. They're not just there from its own side. Someone plonked us here. No, we plonked ourselves here. It's a pretty powerful concept, karma. So we've got this subtle wind energy connected to our different states of mind. That's the mental consciousness. Then as you go through these eight stages of death, which we'll do this morning, it deconstruct and you know, all the pieces cease functioning and the mind gets ever more subtle, ever more subtle, ever more subtle. And the wind energy gets ever more subtle, ever more subtle until you eventually get to the eighth stage. Mm -hmm. well, let me just finish about, sorry, let me finish about the channels, the winds and the chakras again, the, the components, the subtle physical energy, but the wind energies and the channels and then, and then, the, and then those channels, as well as when red and white drops, and the channels are all kind of knotted up. So there's particular spots where they're knotted and that's what I've called a chakra. I mean, we go on about chakras as if it's something special, but it's just a bunch of knotted channels. It's kind of boring. Here, 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 below the navel, and then down below the secret ones they call the male, then on the outside, on the penis, and the female is inside, the central channel, central channel. And there's a constriction of, of channels at each point. So why that's important, let me say talks about it. You see, the whole point, the whole goal, even in the sutra teachings, why you need to get shamatha, calm abiding, a level of samadhi, single-pointed concentration, why you need to go beyond the gross level of conceptuality, why you need to go the gross 
beyond the grosser level of the sensory consciousness because we live at that grosser level. We need to access the subtler level of our capacity for cognition, which is mind. So, of course, we don't posit that in our culture. But this is the unique component of Buddhist teachings and the Indians before him. We need to do that. Why? It's very simple. Because that level of mind is the most potent, the most capable that can then unpack and unravel and get to see reality and realize emptiness and get the hell out of samsara. Can't do it at a conceptual level. Impossible. So the tantric techniques are the same principle, but they're a billion times more powerful, whatever the reasons are, they say. So the way they describe how the mind, when it gets more subtle, is in terms of the fit. So what blocks, so if, we, if the aim is to get the mind to a very subtle level, what blocks the mind from going to that subtle level is all these constrictions in the channels. So, you know, the mind gets very subtle every time you go to sleep. We go through these eight stages of so-called death every time we sleep. Your, your, your eye consciousness ceases, your ear consciousness ceases, your physical ceases, then you become unconscious physically, and then you, and then you might wake up occasionally and have weird dreams. That's your mental consciousness, your subtle consciousness. When you're deeply asleep, you're, you're, you've gone through these eight stages, but no one's conscious. You're fast asleep snoring. There's no awareness. But the great yogis who practice the tantric techniques are spending their lives training, training their minds through their sadhana, we're going to discuss that, and to get to that very subtle level only because that very subtle level is capable of realizations, capable of incredible realizations, and even of getting enlightened, because it's the most subtle. It's unencumbered by all the grosser levels, which are what prevent us from seeing reality. So the, the whole purpose is to get to the very subtle level. So these great yogis, so this is the Vajrayana way of describing um, the process, you know. So the channels all being blocked prevent the mind from becoming, from leaving the side channels and going into the central channel and eventually going here. So these techniques in Tantra are the methods for opening the chakras, you know. It's a highly advanced practice when we talk about it in the regular world, like some special trip. But it's, you've got to be highly advanced to do this, you know, to be in charge of this process. Not to mention you have incredible ethics and morality and living vows and have bodhicitta and all the rest, you know. So they're very technical practices. Lama says Tantra is highly technical, you know. So, we so why you can't go to sleep is because the wind stays stuck in, the, in the, all the outer channels because your mind's berserk. If your mind's calm, the winds calm down, you know. And they, then they unblock the chakras. And these yogis spending their whole lives training their minds to can't be in charge of this process so they can get to the very subtle level. But as one in the chapter here, one chapter I'll read to you, um, death is what the yogis have been waiting for. And Lama talks, Rinpoche talks there about how um, they've been practicing all their lives using this highest yoga tantra technique. Rinpoche talks in here about we can't, they say, okay, I'm saying many things I've got to say in order, I jump around. This is why it's marvelous that, you know, you've got Yamantaka coming here now. It's incredible. It's a highest yoga tantra practice. And they are all, the sadhanas of these are geared exactly to this, to enable us to achieve, to, to purify the mind and purify the body at different stages in order to achieve this, what they call the three kayas of the Buddha. The Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nimmanakaya. And they're all all the sadhanas are struck, even as Ramesha says, it's very, very rare for a short sadhana to do that, but the Yamantaka one does. It's got these stages in it. So the yogis are practicing all their lives doing these sadhanas. It is combining the stages of death completely because it's a natural process that occurs every day when we go to sleep. And then, when the and why they're waiting for death is because the, the clear light mind at the death time is more, much more powerful than even the best yogis can achieve in their life. That's why they, death is what they've been waiting for. This is highly technical. It's technical stuff. Not that I know much. I'm just repeating Lama Zerpa's words, you know. So that's why death is so important. As Mumashe says in that chapter, chapter 10, I think we'll read from it. Why, um, you know, it's the best way to get enlightened. The quickest way to use death to get enlightened. So it's a completely different view from how we think of, you know. Are we communicating? I hope so. Saying everything all jumbled together, I think. 
So as Ramesha says, when we are alive, the knots of the chakras prevent the winds from entering into and flowing in the central channel, with along with the mind. They say the mind rides on the winds. Wherever the winds go, the mind goes. That's why when your winds are berserk, which is attachment energy, everything vomits out your mouth, your actions are berserk, you can't control your mind, you have crazy thoughts, O-D-A-D, O-C-D-D, A-D-H-D, all these words we have. There's a variations of berserk wind energies and berserk attachment. Are we communicating? Right. So while we're alive, the knots of the chakras prevent the winds from entering into and flowing in the central channel. Otherwise, these various winds and the states of mind associated with them would all dissolve into the indestructible drop of the heart chakra. That's what we're, that's what we're aiming for. Go through these eight stages in 25 components, ceasing each one. You do the meditation on each one. We'll go through it. And you imagine it happening. Even that is a great meditation to do. The yogis are doing it actually. And as their mind goes to these stages, they, their mind is actually getting more subtle. And then they're meditating on emptiness all the way. And finally, they can get to the clear light one. And then because that's the most potent level, I call it the microscope of the mind. The microscope of the mind, the subtlest level, the most potent, the most capable level of our mind, unencumbered by all the grosser levels. It's therefore easily capable, easily of seeing emptiness, of realizing emptiness, and even of removing the other obstacles and getting enlightened as well. So they say the tantric techniques are so quick. But otherwise, these various winds and the states of mind associated with them all dissolve into the indestructible drop of the heart chakra, would all dissolve, at which point our extremely subtle consciousness, the mind of clear light, would manifest. And with it, we would meditate on emptiness and thus free ourselves from all delusions, eventually becoming enlightened. Throughout our, their lives, the great meditators train their minds to do this. Lama Yeshi, for example, in his daily tantric practice, would, was able to experience the various visions of the dissolution process, you know, the eight stages, that occur naturally at death. In other words, he didn't need to wait until death to experience them. Lama was able to open the chakras, causing the winds to enter into and flow in the central channel and dissolve at the heart chakra, and thus could meditate in the clear light. Therefore, at the time of death, great yogis can remain in meditation in the clear light for as long as they like, which is what happened with Lama. I discuss this in chapters 10 and 24. Okay. So we've got the gross body, and then industry we link to it, the sensory consciousness. Then we have subtle body, the winds, the channels, the chakras, the drops, connected to subtle mind, which is the mental states. Then we have very subtle mind and very subtle body with an inextricable entity of the subtle wind conjoined with the subtle mind. Inextricable. One entity, two phenomena, so they talk. And that's imprinted with all the karmic imprints. When that leaves the body, programmed by the karma that was triggered before you stop breathing, in our case, my, our mother and father, when we when we our mind left there, it went to the bardo, reverse sort of it's like going into a dream state. And then when they hopped into bed, we ran like a magnet. And here we are now. Okay. So in the, the process of death occurs in eight stages, which I explain in chapter five, nine, we'll go into it, and is experienced by those who have bodies constituted from the sperm of the father and the egg of the mother, human beings and some animals. During the first four stages, we experience the gradual dissolution, or you could say deconstruction, if you like, the piece is falling apart, you know, stopping, stopping functioning, um, of 22 of the 25 components. The eight stages of all these 25 things all cease, and we'll go through them. Four of the five aggregates, four of the five types of wisdom, we'll go into these, the four elements, and then five of the six sense bases, and the five inner sense objects, with all these things we'll discuss. The breath has stopped by the end of the fourth stage. That's when we think we're dead in our culture, you know, because you're not dead yet. And that's the thing that this guy, this journalist, in this book, The Undead, is, 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 is indicating that there's now problems because people come back to life. And there's other pieces he discussed, you know, the one of people's experiences during the, um, while the under anesthetic doesn't fit with the materialist model. It doesn't fit at all. But you can't argue with these experiences. That's what's interesting, you know. 
So in the, during, at the, by the eighth stage, all that's left is the extremely subtle wind conjoined with the extremely subtle consciousness, the mind of clear light, at the indestructible drop. And that indestructible drop consists of the subtle red and white drops, the subtle level of the egg and the sperm of mummy and daddy that your consciousness conjoins with. And then that's the beginning of you when you start developing in the fetus, as a fetus. That's, and it's here at the heart chakra. And it's there all your life. So at death, at death, that indestructible drop at the heart, death occurs when that drop splits open. It's like a little tiny bean, they say, white and red. When it splits open, and the conjoined, extremely subtle wind and mind leaves the body. And that's up to three days later from the time you stop breathing. Can be immediate. Violent deaths, it probably happens immediately. Or if you're going to be born in the hell realms or something, there's no waiting around in the hell realms. There's a zap there, straight away, direct line. But for humans, ordinary people, the mind, the mind can stay in the body for up to three days. So that's roughly. Any questions so far? There's a lot of information, so I'm just saying it as much as I can. Are there any questions so far? I'm going to go into more detail, but are there any questions so far? On Zoom, anything there, please? Nothing, darling? Okay, fine. Yes, sweetheart. Yes. I was just reading about a woman who, she's very young, but she has a lot of uh, physical and mental pain, and she, she chose to, um, you know, end her life. That's so, right. Um, what, how does that affect all of you? I understand that. So that means we have to talk more about karma. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do that. It's a really important point because it's becoming more and more prevalent in the world. It's part of the world now. We accept it. And, uh, you know, we see it as definitely a function of compassion. And we see that, and it's been going like that with animals for a long time. We're, you know, so let's look at that. Okay. So, the, as, La, as His Holiness the Lama says, compassion is not enough. You need wisdom. And as Lama Zopa says, meaning well is not enough. So we can see when it comes to our doggy, forget about grandma, or even deciding to do it yourself, you know. The thing is, the point is, it's not some moralistic issue, oh, it's wrong to kill, you mustn't kill. It's not like an emotional thing. It's a technical point. Listen, if you were a bodhisattva with high realizations, no ego, you could kill yourself 20 times a day if it's beneficial for sentient beings. Or you could kill other people. This is the, that's the point we've got to understand. You see my point? So the only reason we've got to be cautious is that we're driven by attachment. So to do any action based on attachment or aversion, including killing yourself, how can it be useful to anybody? That's the simple, that's the essence of the point, you know? I, always, I remember watching on PBS, on my computer, that series of documentaries on the Vietnam War by that Ken Burns documentary maker. He's a very good filmmaker. And it was it showed in detail, you remember what you'd hear about in the Vietnam days, those monks had burned themselves, you know? So the thing about those monks, they have, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree, Don, they would have to have had samadhi. If you could sit there and burn and burn alive and they didn't move their bodies, they sat there quietly. So we'd have to accept that they had samadhi. They'd have to be. Would you not agree with that? Because when you're in samadhi, you don't, you, you don't, you're not, your senses have ceased, you know? So you, you, you could, I mean, it was all a political issue. Who knows what their motivation was, but they were capable of doing it. I don't know what's in their mind, but they were capable because they went into a subtle state of mind. So, but I mean, let's assume that maybe, hopefully, their motivation was pure. I don't know. Do you understand my point? So the thing is, it's the, um, it's the fact is we're just not capable. So we, we, when we kill our doggy or our grandma, we have to be very sincere. If we look into our mind. The motivation is, in, is, it is compassion. We can see that it is compassion. When you understand that, you know, when you, the motivation, the intention is there and the motivation is there when you do an action, you can't argue that when you kill your dog, you are driven by compassion. You do, you're not doing it out of anger. So if your own mind, you, that compassion has to do something to your mind. It's got to program you with some tendency. But we, what we don't see is our fear and attachment, which is deluded, that is polluting that compassion and prevents us from seeing any, having any wisdom at all. So in other words, you can kill your cat with compassion. Fine for you. Really fine for you. Maybe you don't create too much negative karma. But what about the poor pussycat? We don't even think about what happened to the pussycat. 
but you probably sent it from the frying pan to the fire. In other words, you've got a worse life. So the, the simple point is, is because we don't have wisdom, you just have to be cautious. It's a, it's a technical point. You see my point here? So killing yourself and killing someone else is the same. So a friend of mine recently, his mummy did that. And, and, we, and I remember I had the, the monks and Kopan do medicine puja, medicine Buddha puja right at the time she's going to take the medicine. She seemed very peaceful. She said now to her kids, now you be quiet. I want to meditate. Then the doctor gave her the medicine. Now, you, you can't argue that she might not have got a good, she might have got a good human birth because you don't know her karma. So it doesn't follow that a person who, I think it probably doesn't follow if a person who does decide to do that, they might still get a human body. You don't know. You just don't, The fact of not knowing. In other words, if you we know in daily life, any action you do, if it's likely that there could be a dire result, you'd be very cautious before you do it. You get my point here? So it's a technical issue, really. You see what I'm saying? So like as if, if I've got a headache and you're full of compassion and you have a pill, but you just can't remember whether it was cyanide or aspirin, I promise you, you would rather me have the headache than you kill me so you wouldn't give me the out of compassion. You'd be cautious. You see my point? But because we don't think about reincarnation, and certainly within the human world when we're doing killing ourselves now, we think we've got the right. And of course we have the right. Of course we have the right to kill ourselves. Everyone has the right to do what they like. They're in charge of their life. But it has to be based on wisdom. And of course the view here is based on the view of reincarnation. You see my point? And what causes you to get this life or that life? So it's a practical issue, really. You see my point? Does that make sense to you? You'd look doubtful. I mean, because you've got to be, we've got to see, you see, if every, if, see, generally speaking, the main factor that determines the karma we create is not even the intention I will do it, is the motivation that underpins the intention. You understand that? So it's obvious if you, two people have got a mouse and they're both exactly the same, the object is there, the intention is there, the motivation is there, but one motivation is anger and rage and one motivation is compassion. They both do the action and the result is dead mouse. It's obvious that to include completely different karmic and completely different karmic results. You understand my point? So it's a practical thing. So if you take the view that consciousness will continue and until we're clairvoyant, we can't prove it, so we have to take it as our working hypothesis, then we try to be cautious. You still can't guarantee, if you don't kill your grandma, you still can't guarantee that you'll get a decent human body. But as Lama Zopa says, every second of having a human body, there's always a chance still to purify the mind and be useful, even if they're suffering. So it's just a practical thing. We've got to really think about all this, you know, because it's not the way we think. You get my point here? Yes. We need to hear you. They need to hear you on the Zoom, darling. I need to see you on the Zoom. Tashi Del, Tashi yes. Del, thank you. Lisa, my, Lisa's my name. Thank you. Oh, to hold thank you, Lisa. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you for what you said, because I'm actually at the end of life right now. Okay. I've been in extended retreat, um, mostly in northern India, like the last 10 years. Yes. Um, and my Lama died. Yes. In, and very high Lama. And so... Um, I don't have any teachings around the Bardo, and I've kind of been lost around yes. not having a teacher yes. ask this very important question, yes. which is if I uh, choose to do death with dignity, uh -huh. um, am I going to mess up my karma? I understand that. I don't know. So you're, decide, you're thinking about whether you do that or not. Is that what you're saying? Well, I actually, yeah. I mean, I have a plan to do it because I have to. You know what I mean? Why is that? Um, because... Uh, my illness will then make me a burden to my your what, sweetheart? A burden. Who would you be? You'd be a burden to your children, to the community, to yeah. my daughter. To, right. Um. You know. I, I mean. I, I. My. Why would you? Why do you assume you'll be a burden? Maybe you'll live a long, healthy life. Oh, not no, be a no, burden. I know I'm dying, and I finally have surrendered. Um. I've been doing treatment, treatment. You know. I see. Okay. At yeah. at uh, Menzikon doing all Tibetan. Oh, I see, amazing. Uh, no, yes. I know that I'm dying, yes. and now I know that the disease yes. is taking. I understand that. Brain. So, is the reason you want to kill yourself then because you mainly it's not so much fear of it of well, the pain? I, I, is I, that I, partly? I mean, I agree with what you said around compassion, how we uh, how we euthanize animals. But uh, which part do you agree with there? Because it's mer for mercy, you know. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. Oh, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it is compassion from our side if I kill my cat. 
But because I'm not clairvoyant and can't see the mind of the cat and can't say with certainty that when I kill it, it will definitely get a really good human body, then it's compassion isn't enough. We need wisdom. I didn't make the point clear okay, enough. Yes, now I understand. You see, for our side, if we kill ourselves or our cat, or even at the cat, we can say there is compassion. But we, because we don't have enough wisdom to see exactly what will happen to the cat's mind, then it's playing Russian roulette with the cat. Exactly. So that's just the point there. But to kill yourself, see, the other lovers open might say to you, well, actually, how incredibly fortunate for your community and your children to create the incredible merit of taking care of you when you're sick and dying. And that's a major spiritual practice. How could you deny these people of that? You could say that to yourself if you like. Well, most people in this in the West, in America, put um, old or sick people in a, in a nursing home. That's just been my experience. I understand that, yes, I know. Um, but I do, I am very worried about that ex, that, ex, that exact point because I, um, you know, I have been in extended retreat for a long time and I do, you know, that's all I do is my practice and I'm very, very blessed to have my monistic life. And I am worried about that Russian roulette thing because if I, um, if I'm in so much pain that I cannot, um, actually meet my maker to have a good reincarnation because I'm in so much pain or I'm completely gorked on drugs. How am I going to, you know, go through the porto? I hear you. I do hear you. It's all very good points, isn't it? But isn't, don't, wouldn't you agree that if you really, that somehow if you really practice every day, you are creating the cause to have a good death? Well, it's not I did, set in yeah. stone that it will be bad. It's not set in stone that no one will take care of you. If you've got lots of merit and practice every day, you will create the cause to have everything work perfectly. Because I do live a monistic life for the last because two years. Because you what? Monistic life. I cannot, could not be a nun because I'm disabled, but I studied to become a... a okay, so why don't you trust virtue more every day and just practice every day and aspire to do what's most beneficial and let your karma take care instead of trying to sort of organize it all and, and well, set it in stone. Perhaps that's a better way to go. Do so you focus every day on your practice and allow your karma to manifest? Because I know, because I've been isolated, nobody is going to come. But why should you have anybody? Why do you need anybody? Well, you're perfect with yourself in meditation. Why do you assume that won't happen? Because you pray for that to happen. What happens if somebody... Uh, lose their ability to what happens if a million things you can think about but perhaps if you think positively i'm only making giving other thoughts to you not telling you what to no, do this is why i can then maybe i know i hear you so just i mean when we really i think i'm just talking when we really trust this view of karma everything we think and do and say programs us and brings the results but as long as the Dalai Lama says you know Always aspire to do what is most beneficial. And if you can, long-term, better than short-term, that programs your mind and that creates your future. We create our own conditions. So if you pray every day and practice every day and rely on your guru, why do you not think another possibility would be that you would die a perfect death with no pain and no burden to anybody? Because I have the experience of being... I beg your pardon? Because I have the experience of, of being... What? extremely ill and in a lot of pain deep deep suffering and then so far you're dealing pretty well with it sitting you're sitting here you're doing amazing you're in retreat you're practicing i'm just happy yeah, there is there is going to be an end date there must be an end date because huh. nobody is going to come around that's been my experience well then no the family. Family. what i'm getting at is maybe you don't need anybody you'll die a yogi's death but i think, think that's a possibility uh because the, i've seen the mris in my brain scan Oh, and yeah. you know that anyway so anyway i can't so just play every, if i just think you don't know what you're going to do you're not you haven't made a decision yet right excuse me have you made your decisions about what you plan to do yet um i'm i mean i'm in process of Are you? right now yes right and so i feel really thought that it was a god thing when sister told me that it was here because i did lose my llama and i do want to know about if I do take my own life i yes. do not want to cause harm to anybody and i don't want to cause and, I do. and you don't want to cause harm to yourself either. No, you? not, no, that's not, a, maybe but... the thing to do. I'm just suggesting. I don't know. If every day you keep your llama close and you every day have this aspiration, I'm not sure what the right thing to do is. I can't see my karma. I'm not clairvoyant. But may I do what's most beneficial? May the best thing happen? May I always make the right choices? May the best. Every day sincerely and then take one step at a time and then see how things go. Let things unfold. This, what's wrong with that suggestion? Because uh, this has been 10 years going on. Is, what's wrong with that suggestion? Is it a, uh, a good for you? Is that it, I, 
you know, and maybe because I'm a social justice lawyer, that I have to look at the evidence. And I got stroked 10 years ago. When my daughter was on, I think, nine or 10. And no one even told her what it was until she went to health class, uh -huh. you know. And mm -hmm. she has been there suffering with me throughout all of this. Okay. And I do not want to be a burden to her. And you understand that, darling? So my suggestion is not so helpful. Is what? Not so helpful. Not so helpful. Uh, what suggestion. What did I suggest to you? That was my advice. The one piece of advice I can think of. What was I? What did I suggest to you? What did you think? What I was suggesting. Perhaps I said it too quickly. To, to do my practice, to be with my llama, and just to surrender that it, maybe it'll be a different scenario than what I'm saying. I sort of said that. But when we realize the power of the mind, and you realize the power of intention, every second you say. May I do? Okay, may I ask you a question? Yes. Would you like to do what is most beneficial? Would, no, uh, not uh, whatever the outcome is, I'm not asking you that. Do you want to do what's most beneficial? Of course, always. And have the aspiration. I do. I no, do. What, I'm, no, what I'm meaning is every day I, you say to yourself, I don't know what the outcome would be. I could speculate, but I do. And you say this to your guru, I do want to do what's most beneficial, which is. And as I'm telling you, it says long term, better than short term. So every second aspire, may I do what's most beneficial. And that programs your mind. And then as you move along, the choices will become evident. So treat it for one step at a time. Perhaps it's just a thought. You trust the power of your mind and karma and the holy beings and your virtue. And then see what happens. I'm not saying not kill yourself, kill yourself. I'm not saying it. I'm saying this. This is a thought. That's that. It uh, might end up, whatever it might end up being is whatever it is. If it's beneficial, you'll do it, you know. So may I ask one question? Sure. I'm sorry I'm taking that time. Yeah. Um, uh, but this is, you know, I, I, I've been, I'm a very serious um, practitioner and, you know, I, I, this is concerning me because I do have, and I do have the evidence. I understand that, darling. What's your other question? Um, you said another question. What's the other one, sweetheart? Well, I, I, I think that I need to say to you that it's much further along than that because what is further when along? I, than, I, when sweetheart, I, what is further along than when that? I came back from India just recently after yeah, being there? Good. I did all the tests, you know. Again, I understand this. So, what's the other question, darling? They came back bad. I understand that. What's the other question, sweetheart? Uh, so, if I have evidence in my brain that it's going to be, I'm going to lose my ability to make decisions and I'll be either. I understand. So if every day you decide to do what's most beneficial, when the time comes, you will do what's most beneficial. Well, I won't be able to do what's most so beneficial. Be able to do it then. So just, I'll, I won't be able to, I'll lose my capacity. Okay, so what's the, what's the question, when, girl? When somebody loses, that's, that to me is rolling. The I understand, place. darling. When I'm very far along in mm -hmm. all of this and, um, and, and, and always do everything with intention. I understand, darling. Um, and I have tried. I tried very, very hard to get better. I did everything. I understand, sweetheart. Now so, I know it's yeah. not. So and what's I, the question, darling? Question so, girl, dearest, most precious person, and I trust every word you're saying. Ask me your question. Um, I I have the evidence. I understand that. That's a state. So I'm. What's the so, we're, so the decision is with my daughter. We're going to make it with my daughter and I. She's not going to want. I'm not going to want to be a burden. I understand, either. darling. Either. I understand. So I don't want to end my life or be in the bardo in, no, right. in a in in the wrong way. I understand, I darling. I really yeah. want to. I mean, I'm looking at death doulas. I understand, um, You know, uh, yes. final exit. There's mm -hmm. two in Switzerland. Sure. You know, I'm really thinking about this in the most that. thoughtful way, and I'm very concerned about it. And then when I researched it, mm -hmm. it gave me a lot of peace that it seemed like as many mm -hmm. llamas as you asked is as many llamas mm -hmm. answers as you're going to get mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I don't even think of it as suicide. So what? Is, so you so, okay? So then you try to do what's most that's with dignity and do what's right. most beneficial, whatever it might be, darling. And if you trust your heart and trust your llamas and trust your compassion, you will do what is most beneficial. I have confidence in that. Well, so my mom died. died. So, mom died. That's enough. That'll be for now. Okay. Just trust your wisdom, trust your virtue, trust your merit, and trust your gurus, and you will make the right decision. Okay. Okay. Do you understand you. me? Hmm? Do you understand? Um, well, I'll, do you understand, understand what I said? Well, you will make, if you have that wish to make the right decision, you will make the right decision. But remember, as Lama Zoba would tell you, every second, if you are such a devoted practitioner, then every second you are suffering, 
if you have the bodhisattva attitude, you'd be in yes. you would be in bliss of joy that you're purifying eons and eons of suffering karma. So be so that other part of you be happy. That's what Lama Zopa would suggest to you. I do feel that. And it's amazing. It's so special. So keep moving, done. sweetheart. You're amazing. <laughs> okay. So why don't we have a tea break? I think I'd rather have a tea break than a lunch break yet. Thank have you. A tea sir. break, and then we'll have lunch Nine. at like twelve thirty. What do you think? Except lunch is turning up at twelve, is it? What's happening to lunch? When does lunch come? Can someone tell me, please, when is lunch coming? Take a break anyway, and then we'll maybe, but say we'll be ready at 12.15 for lunch. Have a 10-minute break now, just walk in, walk out, come back in 10 minutes, and then we'll have lunch at 12.15. Can you tell Linton and um, Char Charlene we're having lunch at, <laughs> where's the, my gallery? There we are. Okay, are there any other questions, please, about what we have discussed so far, and then we can um, just touch on the eight stages of death before our lunch in half an hour. We can do that. But are there any questions first? No, nothing online. So let's go through the eight stages. Just touch on each thing that happens. And then, of course, the meditation is there. You can do it. We can whatever. So we'll just uh, go through it, okay? And then we'll discuss it later and go to more detail after lunch. Here we go. Right. Okay. So the stages of death, intermediate state, and rebirth. So the first one, the first is gross consciousness. That's the first four of these eight stages. And each of these stages is labeled in terms of a, what they call a subtle vision that occurs in the mind that the yogis would actually see. And this occurs, this entire process, see, that's the thing, physiologically, this is the same, and, and psychologically, the same process every time we go to sleep, which is a really interesting concept, you know? Every time you go into a coma, it's the same process that occurs because we're not conscious, so the great yogis are conscious. So they call the vision of a mirage. So, you know, you've got these, I'm just trying to keep it simple, these are different points, it's all listed. There's these five things that occur at each stage. So first of all, the aggregate of form, which is your body, you know, it ceases, it becomes more thin. Your limbs become loose and unmanageable. Then there's these five, what they call mirror, I mean, there's wisdoms. It's a bit abstract sounding, but it's a particular the mind works, okay? And the first one is called the mirror-like wisdom. These, um, your ability to see many things all at once as a mirror reflects many objects together. That ceases. And you can't see the forms of things. So in other words, it's related to the eye consciousness too. It become, things become blurry. Now you look at this. If I'm becoming sleepy and I'm talking to Don, this is exactly what's happening. Your, your body becomes heavy, doesn't it, when you're, when, you're, when you're tired. And your eyes start to glaze over. I'm still sitting upright, but I'm looking at Don, but it's sort of glazing because the eye consciousness is beginning to cease. This mirror-like wisdom, we don't label that, is ceasing. The, earth, the form and then your earth element. Your body gets very heavy almost as if you're sinking into the ground. I know when I was in India years ago in the late 80s or early 90s, I got hepatitis and malaria together in the middle of summer, 110 degrees every day in Delhi. And I literally was nearly dying, you know? So I knew I had to get out of India, otherwise I would have died. So I got to Australia. I went to, on the way, my sister picked me up in Singapore. She flew especially to Singapore to pick me up and I was bright yellow. It was incredible. And Air India was so kind to even let me fly, you know? So I was in Singapore and in this hotel on the way to Australia, and it was air conditioning. First of all, it was the most blissful experience in the universe, as if I'd gone to heaven. After 110 degrees and no AC and no fans even in this house and hallucinating from all these fevers. I'll never forget that AC, you know. But my body, I had that feeling of sinking into the bed. So I was still close to death, you know. It's interesting, that feeling. It's a, your body feels like it's heavy. We know that. And your eyes kind of glaze over. We know that too. So the first, first mirage, and then there's this vision. They say it's like a mirage, and in a way, that's the interplay of these four elements. So the first one is the interplay of earth and water, like a mirage, they say. And this is there when you really, when you have your mind more subtle, you can be aware of this. So when you meditate on this, you can practice as if, you know, you train yourself to go through these eight stages, visualizing them. Then the second one is, and all this is very organic, and it can happen quite quickly, but it seems like it can happen fairly slowly too. But the, in general, when Lama Zopa teaches it, he talks about it, Kind of in this, as if this starts, this starts a couple of hours before you stop breathing. 
The next one is the vision of, they call it the vision of smoke, which is really the interplay of next one, which is water, earth, water, interplay of water, and the next one, which is um, fire, isn't it? It's like, they call it like smoky. I think it could be more like steamy, you know, whatever. So the aggregate of feeling, which is this feeling of pleasure, pain, and indifference that ceases. Then this wisdom, they say, of equanimity. I don't understand that one. Water elements, the, the liquids in your body start to dry up, you know. You know when you wake up in the morning, you, your mouth's very dry, your eyes are very dry. Because when you went through the process of all these deconstruction of these components and throughout the sleep, your physical body's not working so much or something, you wake up in the morning, it's dry because your water element is kind of coming back. And you know when you wake up and you're really exhausted, your body feels like lead because the earth element hasn't come, come quite back yet, you know, something like that. Ear consciousness begins to go. Now, the thing is here is about the second stage. As Babonka Rinpoche Lama Zopa quotes him, you know, your dying thoughts activate the karma that will be the cause of your next rebirth. And the activators of this throwing karma, which is the karma that is triggered, like I said before, that throws you into the next life, are the eighth and ninth links, like I mentioned before, craving and grasping, you know. So whether you're high medit I mean, until you hardly realize you're going to have these craving and grasping, it just happens. But even if you're a fairly quiet person and virtuous, there's still going to be this fear there. It's quite intense. And this is all the more reason why we need people whom we adore, who are kind to us, there supporting us, calming us, making us feel confident. Like I said yesterday, we all need people to help us. We need that. Especially at death, you know. Think of all those people in the old people's homes, like you said, you know. Have some one kind person being there, lifting you. So important. So basically, if at that time, a negative, very strong, a lot of fear, which, which means it's related to negative thoughts, panic, fear, anger, attachment, that's, if that's there at the time, that can trigger the number two link, which is the karmic seed, a negative one or a positive one for then determine your next life, either a, a decent human rebirth or a suffering rebirth. I'm sure it's all much more technical than this, but it's just touching on the points, you know. This is why, as Ramadan says, the main thing, if you want to help anybody in this life, the time they need you is right at this time, right here. Help you navigate this point, you know, to help you stay calm and virtuous, which then can trigger a virtuous karmic seed. And then you're programmed. In our case, wherever we were in the past life, before we stop breathing, the karmic seed of, our non, of a non-killing karma as Lama Zopa says, give it our lives now, would have been practiced in the context of a spiritual path, even more likely practiced in the context of giving vows of non-killing. That karmic seed was triggered before we stopped breathing in the past life, which already programmed us to go to this present mother. They didn't make you. They just provided you with a body, your mummy and daddy. You created the cause to go there, you know, that mother, that father. That's a really intense concept, isn't it? But it seems to be at the same time as that karmic seed that's triggered that determines this human body we've got now, all the other karmic seeds that bring the other three results have to also surely be triggered at that point as well. That's to be logical. Which means your tendencies in this mind, your experiences and the environmental result. So you're, you're already completely programmed by this point at which you start to stop breathing. Already it is programmed for your next life, whether it's a lion birth or a human birth, you know. And the way the lamas say, okay, we'll go to the next point. Number three, now, the, 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 you know, the eyes are beginning to go, the ears are going, earth is going, water, and now fire, the heat in your body starts to go. And the way they describe this is very interesting. They talk about all the energies, as everything gets more subtle, is going down towards the heart chakra and up towards the heart chakra. Everything comes to the end in the heart chakra. That's how they talk. So the, the way the heat leaves the body, they say, can be an indicator of what kind of karma has been triggered, which determines your future rebirth. So they say, if you're going to have a suffering rebirth, the heat will leave your head first. And your, the feet will stay all toasty. That's not a good sign. If you're going to be born as a human, your feet will get cold first and your head will stay toasty. That's better. I always joke and say, I don't know what you're going to do if the feet get cold first, but you've got to put a water bottle on them or something to keep them warming in. I'm just joking. It's so stupid, you know. But all these, these are all, you can see it's technical points. And all this is coming from where? From the experiences of the great yogis, you know, who, who observed all this and have written it all down. It's not coming from the sky somewhere. You don't believe a word of it. You have to look into it. 
So then the vision of a flame, the fourth of the four stages, the first four of the gross consciousness, earth, water, fire, and now air, the breath goes out. The, 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 uh, the tactile consciousness and the tongue consciousness cease. Before that, the third one, the, the nose consciousness ceased. And by this point, you've lost the plot, you know. And even the, 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 the wisdom they talk about before that, the, by the time the fire one came and the feeling one, you can't tell the difference. You could have your worst, your worst ugliest uncle on the left-hand side and your beloved boyfriend on the right, and you can't tell the difference. You've lost the plot. And by the fourth stage, you don't even know who you are. You've no longer put anything together, you know. And that tongue, as Geshe Rabton said, I love this, that spent, it apparently turns blue and gets very short. That tongue that spent its life gossiping, he said, is now useless. By that point, we think you're dead. But your grosser consciousness, your sensory and your body have ceased. The heart has stopped. The, you know, the war... The, the warmth is still there. I know when I went home to my sister who died, she fell down the stairs, my older sister, a few years ago, fell on her head, destroyed her brain, and then she was, they kept her alive. And all my sisters have no interest in all these ideas. So I kept saying, please keep her alive until I'm there. She's dead, Ravita. I said, I know that, but just keep her alive. Would you keep her breathing? So I wanted to say some prayers in her ear, you know. But when I stayed with her, because all my sisters, she, she was a fanatic in Australia, we, when, you, when you have a football team, you, called a bar you barrack for a football team. It's a very weird phrase. But she was a fanatic Sydney Swans barracker. It's the Australian rules football, which is so extreme and insane. It just runs the country. So she was a fanatic. So she even wrote a memoir called her Lifelong Love Affair with the Sydney Swans. Anyway, she even had, so they had red and white was their colour. So all my sisters and my brother, she had, they had her dressed in her red and white, you know, thing with this red and white scarf and they all sang the Sydney Swan song. So here's me trying to say mantras in her ear and we're all very bossy, the lot of us, the six sisters and a brother, well, one of them's dead now, we're all bossy. So we really had to really control ourselves not to dominate each other and I'm trying to do these prayers and they're a bit cynical of it. And, and I was like, it was all this noise and shouting and they say the best thing is to be quiet, you know. And they're singing the Sydney Swans and I'm sure she preferred the Sydney Swans to Jen Raising, but I was trying to sneak mantras in her ear. So then when she died, they also say, don't touch the body. And there they are holding her legs and crying and hugging her. And, and I try to sit there doing my best. And then they, then they finish. She's dead now. They go. They all went. And I stayed with her for a few hours, you know. Anyway, I'm just telling you. But the, I noticed the warmth. I didn't say long enough. But there were still masses of warmth, of course, at your core. The heat is really strong. So I didn't. I had three or four hours, but still the warmth was really there. And I couldn't tell whether it was warmth at the heart chakra or not. I had no idea. Do you understand, Don? I couldn't work it out. They say that one of the ways to know whether the consciousness is still there, even after three days, before three days, is this warmth at the heart chakra. But I couldn't tell that. It was just the core, you know. So it takes a while, I suppose, when the core heat goes, if the mind is still there, if it were three days, probably there would still be warmth. Do you understand what I'm saying? At the heart chakra. Anyway, it's just an interesting experience. So by this time, you stop breathing, Okay. And as Lama Zobra says, the outer breath and the gross consciousness, which is a sensory, they've ceased. So now during the next stages, these more subtle things occur. You know, they talk about these signs. So the next one, roughly speaking, I mean, it's very rough. Now the mental states are gradually ceasing, gradually ceasing, gradually it's getting more subtle, more subtle, more subtle. And the physical indicator of these is they say this, the fifth stage is the white kundalini, which is predominantly here, also goes through it's at the heart. But it also goes throughout all the channels. And then it, it, it predominantly here, they talk about this is the source of the capacity of the human body to experience um, pleasure. It goes down the central channel and comes to the heart chakra. Then the vision there, the fifth one, is this white, like a white sky, they say. Experience the white vision, the mind of white appearance, like very bright moonlight in autumn, or like the almost white sky caused by the light of the rising moon when everything is covered with snow. That's what they say. Let me show you. And the next one is the red from the from the navel chakra. The red, which is the capacity, gives the capacity for the human body to experience um, heat, and comes up to the central to the heart chakra. Then there's a red vision. It's a sixth sign. The red vision, the mind of red increases like the clear red sky just before the dawn breaks, like a copper red reflection in the sky. Then finally, the seventh stage 
the red and the white, this red coming down, white coming down, red coming up, enclose the heart chakra. So this black, like a faint. I mean, we're all unconscious of this. But the yogis go through these. They see them. They notice. They're there. They're aware. Meditating emptiness all the way. And they call this a dark appearance. It's as, as if you've fallen into darkness or like the dark and empty sky or being in a dark room. And then when that opens, that's the clear light mind, the subtlest level. So all the grosser levels of physicality have ceased. All the grosser levels of the mind have completely ceased. And this is this subtlest level of your being. And then, of course, the yogis practicing all their lives and then practicing through this stage, they're actually going through these stages consciously at each level, totally mentioning on emptiness all the way until they get to the clear light. And that because it's the most powerful level, the most potent, capable level, they're able to stay in their mind, many of them stay in their body for, I mean, days, weeks, months, some of them, as many reports, you know. Lama Yeshi passed away in a hospital in Los Angeles. And he stayed in his body for five days when they, they drove him down from up from Los Angeles to our center, Rajapani Institute on the Northern California, near, near the, near, the, Bay, near, the uh, near Santa Cruz, sort of, in the Redwoods. And then everybody came from all over the world and we spent five days in his, and when they took him to do the special burning, they put him in a chair, dressed in special robes, and his body was flexible still. Five days he'd been in meditation in his body and it was no smell, it was no stink. His mind to be there meditating for five days. And then, the, then the, and then, then, then how the mind leaves the body at the time of death. So death occurs when the indestructible drop splits open and this extremely subtle mind and the wind together leave your heart chakra. And depending on which rebirth you take, exit the gross body at one point or other. So if you'll be born in a pure land of a Buddha, the mind leaves through the crown chakra. Just in front, the crown chakra is in, just in, if, it were, if the spine goes all the way up, the central channel is just in front of the spine and the crown chakra will be just in front of it, sort of the back of your head. It goes from there. And one of the things they say, we'll say it later, that if you, if you, have to, you know, when, when before you move the body, after maybe you've kept it for three days or even a day, you tap very strongly there or pull the hair very strongly there. And that could encourage the consciousness to go from the heart chakra and to zap up and go out through the crown chakra, which could help them get a pure land rebirth. As we talked yesterday. So, which happened? What is it? Okay. Um, it's through the, if it goes through the, it leaves through the eyes. This is an indication, and of course you can't, you don't know these things. We're not clear what we can't see. It could be human rebirth. Mouth is a spirit hungry ghost rebirth. Anus is a hell rebirth. Hell beings and sex organ would be a uh, animal. Something like that. Something like that. So when the mind leaves the body of a man, the white body cheetah continues down the central channel and leaves through the sex organ. And they say that's a sign. When the mind has left, you see a little kind of white drop there. But all, for a female, the red one goes up. On the male, the red one goes up and comes out the nose, a little pinkish. And it's reversed for the female. And then what happens is the second that the indestructible drop opens, that second you become an intermediate state being, even before your mind leaves that body. And then you kind of do reverse of the eight stages and wake up in like a dream state, which is what happens when you go to sleep. You go through the eight stages, you go to unconsciousness, and then you wake up in a dream state. That's, your, that's like reverse stages. You go through the verse eight, and you have all these dream states, of your mental consciousness. Same as a, this is a bardo. The radical difference between a dream and the bardo is you're out of the body. You know, you're not in the body any longer. And you are finished. According to Lama Zopa, the second that begins, and the being is over, when the bardo being starts, and even if you see, you're clairvoyant because you're subtle, your mind's subtle, you can see the body, you can see your family, but you have no interest because it's all over. There's no longer, you don't recognize anybody or anything. You have no interest in going back. It's all finished. Karma's over. Gone. So you can say after 49 human days, I mean, how you count time, I think, is very interesting. I, mean, I think that's a really interesting point, the way you we experience time. We can see that, can't we, in a very dramatically different way. If there's a lot of pain, time feels much longer, doesn't it? So we, can, we still measure it objectively into seconds and hours, you know. But I remember my own experience, one man, one, I remember years ago, in the 90s, I saw a video on YouTube, not on YouTube then, whatever was existing then, on the, on, on the computer, one American doctor who... Um, 
through his interviews with his patients, discovered a lot of them had near-death experiences, but they didn't just have the nice white light ones. They had terrible hell-like experiences. So we interviewed them, which was very fascinating. And one fellow, he was in hospital waiting for his heart operation, and he said he'd been kind of self-centered and ugly and mean to his wife. And another one admitted to he'd been mean to his wife. They both admitted to being mean to their wives. So anyway, he had, had to have a heart operation. He's very worried about it. And suddenly he finds himself out of the bed talking to his wife and she's not listening and he gets annoyed. He looks at the bed and he sees his body still in the bed. So he's having this mental experience of being out of his body. But the point is, as Lama Zopa says, you're not, you're not out of your body. If you were out of your body, you'd be dead. But the experience of the mental consciousness of having these visions, like in your operating table, you float above things. Do you understand? But that's just the experience of the mental consciousness when it's not the sensory. So he imagined he was out of his body. And then he heard the doctor, somebody in the hallway, come on, John, come on. You're all good. I'll go for my operation. And he goes with them. And the way he described it was very interesting. He said, first of all, they're all nice and lovely and take him on the, hospital, the corridor. And then they, you know, and they were being nice to him. And then they start to become mean to him and ugly and ripping his flesh and beating him and abusing him. And then they left him. And he said, it was the darkness and despair, the likes of which he had never known. But the point he said before I finish the story, he said, that journey along that corridor took as long as walking from here to Alaska. So even if it was in Oregon, or Washington, it was still a long walk. Do you understand? And so then that's the experience. It could have been three seconds, if you think about it. It could have been three seconds of a human time. But the experience was of this ancient time. So often I think about how they talk about eons in the hell realms. I think it's the experience of time. It has to be, don't you think? I find that so fascinating. It took as long as walking from here to Alaska. I find that very fascinating. Anyway, the end of the story is... He was, didn't know what to do. So he, he hadn't prayed since he was a little boy. So he started saying, our father who art in heaven, and he couldn't go any further. And then he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and he couldn't go any further. And then he just shouted out, Jesus, help me. And from a long way away, a tiny light, and it came closer and closer, more amazing it was Jesus, more brilliant, more divine, completely encompassed him, healed his body, healed his mind. He was in total bliss. And he wanted to go with him. And Jesus says, no, you go back and serve me. So he did. And he would. Wouldn't you? So that was one experience. And the other one, this other fellow, he was mean to his wife as well. And he was an alcoholic. So then he found this experience of this tunnel. They all talk about a tunnel, you know, and even the, the way that the lamas say it. You know, when, you, when you, if you're going to be born in the lower realms, if a negative seed is triggered before you stop breathing, the vision is terrifying. It's like you're going into the dark and it's a horrifying experience, you know, even before you die. Same as with a good one. If you die a happy death, it's blissful. So this guy, he had the experience of this long tunnel and there was this conflagration, this hideous fire at the end, and it was hell. And all his friends were there and he saw them in their physical form and they were screaming at him, go back, go back, don't come here, go back, go back. So he went back and served Jesus as well. And again, wouldn't you? I'm not joking. So these visions that people have. So my feeling is just the karmic appearances. That fellow, if he'd been praying to, if he'd been praying to Jesus and suddenly a green naked lady comes, he would have got a big shock. Tara, in other words, the Buddha Tara. So it's karmic appearances, you know. I find that so interesting, those experiences. Anyway, so yeah, before you pass away, before that, when the, the grasping is triggered, the eight, ninth link, and then that's the trigger for the karmic seed number two of the six of the 12 links to be triggered, then if, it's, if your mind is virtuous, and one of the, and for us in our case, our virtuous karmic seed was triggered, then our death would have been very peaceful. I remember at Vajrapani used to, years ago, Australian guy who was married to, um, who's the one up in the, she lives up at the top of the house and does massage. Huh? No, another one, the other one. That's one. She had an Australian husband. I remember he was at Vajrapani Institute, this place in California, and he fell off, He was working on the Gompa roof and he fell off the roof and he died in her arms. And she said he was radiant. Because a virtuous karmic seed must have been triggered. So when that, if that happens, it's, you've still got your wits about you when the karmic seed is triggered, which determines your next life, he, you can, you can, death will be blissful. Because your mind gets more, more subtle and you're seeing something good coming. So it's like a blissful experience, you know. Steve Jobs, I, remember, I love Steve Jobs, okay? When he died, I read his, the memoir of one of his, his daughters from his previous marriage, and there was this, that in San Francisco, that 
Sergi Lumpa monk who was identified by Lati Rinpoche as he's a Brazilian, as a Rinpoche. Sergi Rinpoche, you know him? You ever met him? Oh, he's a lovely person, a dear man. He's got his own center, his own robe, special trip, but he's a healer. And, and apparently he was there with Steve Jobs one time. So I was very happy about that. Anyway, the day he died, his sister, they'd been separated at birth because they were given off, you know, um, orphaned, what do you call? Adopted, thank you. Sold off to some place. Adopted, yeah. Anyway, she, she was a writer and she wrote about how it was. So she, she rang that day he died and they said, come quickly, he's on the way out, he's going, you know. So she came and she said he was packed, ready to go. That's a wonderful statement, isn't it? Because he could see from what he wrote, he was really aware of death and impermanence. He was a very interesting fellow, you know, so he's ready for it. So he, um, skinny as a rake, he had liver cancer or something. And so it was very interesting. So let's say Mary is Steve Jobs, and I'm quite close. I'm his sister, and I'm fairly close to him. And in between us is his two daughters facing him, and that's Steve Jobs. And I'm watching Steve's face. And she, he's, she said he's looking with such love into the eyes of his daughters, begging them to forgive him for leaving them, not like freaking out and grasping, you know. And then he looked over their shoulder into the distance and he goes, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, and he died. Isn't that incredible? I love that story. And so the, the, the view here is because his mind's going more subtle and he's seeing a vision of his future life. And his hope was a pure land, you know. I find, I like these stories, you know. I think they're wonderful. Anyway, let's finish the death process. Hang on, we'll go to detail later. So the intermediate state is just like a dream. And so if you're going to have a good life, then the intermediate, the dreams will be very nice. And we know some dreams can be blissful. We know that, you know. Other dreams can be like nightmares, depending on the karma that was right, that was triggered, you know. So and depending on how long you have to wait for your new rebirth, kind of like twiddling your thumbs, waiting for your new mummy and daddy to hop into bed. So the, anyway, they go into the bardo a lot, but just as this is like a dream state, and it can be pleasant or unpleasant. So the karmic seed is already triggered for you to have your rebirth. So this is why I just mentioned before, we'll go into this later, about when I read from the book about, you know, about organ giving. We'll do that later, but that could be a thing that could disturb this. If, if you stop breathing, and then we'll go that later. We said that later yesterday. We'll go into it later. So when finally your new mother and daddy or the new lion mother and father, whatever the karma you have is, are ready to hop into bed, and there's plenty of lion births and dog births and worm births available, so probably no waiting around. Not kidding. Not to mention spirit or hell beings. But let's say human case for us, like human. So then your new mother and father, in our case, you know, you might – the. Um, time they the condition comes the external condition for your life they come together driven by attachment that's why they say the whole universe is driven by attachment it's created by attachment this entire universe you know so this energy of their two attachment that brings the egg and the sperm together that's the condition i need to get a birth so what i'd leave the intermediate state within a millisecond i might have died in africa but i don't have to get a plane to melbourne australia when mummy and daddy were in bed you just go there that second and, you, and, you, and what drives you there is attachment, intense attachment. And this is what sounds hilarious. You're driven by intense attachment for this intense of sexual, sexual union with, if you're going to be born a girl, with your father. If you're going to be born a boy, this intense attachment drives you to your mother. And when you get to the egg and sperm in a millisecond, I'm going to swear now, you get pissed off. Because all you see is the sex organs. And that anger then cuts it and you zap into that egg and sperm. That's how you get born. And as Lama Zopa says, it is easy to see how ordinary birth is caused, caused by delusions and karma. In other words, it is not a, a sacrament from God. That's a fact, not from the Buddha. All right? Now we can have lunch and chat about this. This is a very different view of, re, of the universe, right? Oh, I like it. Anyway, I think it's great. I'm not, I don't know if it's true yet. I'm not clairvoyant, but I enjoy it. So why don't we just have our lunch? Think of our lunch differently. Think of the lunch cooked by all these kind people and all the creatures who died for the vegetarian lunch, you know. And we're going to eat this food and be fat and healthy so we can continue to work on our minds and benefit sentient beings and help others and become a Buddha eventually. And as well, we bless it with energy of Om Mahung, Om Mahung, Om Mahung, these three Sanskrit syllables that melt into it and turn it into a complete nectar. And then we imagine offering it to everybody in the universe. And then we see them all experiencing the joy of receiving it. Lama Sange Lama Che, Deje Lama Gedonte, Kungi Jeva Lama Te, Lama Namla Che Pabu. And then once you've done that, Lama Zopa says, the bigger your stomach, the better.
So please enjoy lunch. And if you want to talk, I, don't, I can't be a policeman. If you're going to talk, talk about this stuff. If you don't want to, then be silent. Nothing wrong. Talk about the weather and the politics later. All right? So see you in about an hour and a quarter, I think is good.